Okay, so welcome back. Um, so today I'll start the second section of this lecture. Um, the title will be Tasks and Resources. And uh, I'll start by a few very simple things that you know from quantum mechanics um, of the type of what you can do according to quantum mechanics. Right? And uh, actually, the first item is actually uh, is in every quantum mechanics text. So one thing that you cannot do is uh, a dispersion free preparation. And I'll make a few remarks on that. So, um, one cannot get rid of uh, the probabilistic aspect. Right? By sharp preparation, or by better. And the first, uh, as far as I know, the first to, to, to ask this question in any precise way was uh, John von Neumann. And he was also, in, the, in, in this context, he was the first to compute the state space of quantum mechanics. And so, a very simple, this is of course, we have seen that several times, so here we have a rock ball. And this, these are all the preparations. Right? That's what he computed. Um, so for a two by two system, for a qubit system, that is all the preparations you can make. And none of them has this feature that it would get, give deterministic answers to uh, all measurements. Right? So for example, if you pick this point of pure state, north pole on the blob sphere, then it's true that if you make a sigma z measurement, you get a deterministic result plus. But that is actually the only one for, you get, for which you get some, some outcome with probability 1. All the, so so every, something will always cut. Now, um, so this is, of course, the, the basic, basic question also behind uh, some quantitative measure of this. is just the standard uncertainty relations. Right? So if you have a P of Vm, so F uh, A outcomes, no? uh, so P of Vm measurement, then uh, any result A appearing with certainty Certainty, um, uh, you can also say that 1 minus f times this thing, which is positive, is 0. So this actually requ requires uh, that rho uh, is an eigenstate. Now pick different observables, 
Um, of course, typically they don't have the same eigenstates for the for eigenvalue one. And the, the standard way, so uh, so a real valued, uh, I mean a uh, projection valued measurement. Standard scheme that you know, and then uh, you would just have, a, have to have an eigenstate of A. Right? So, uh, mean eigenstate of A. Right? So, in the operator sense. So, typically measured, of course, is the, is, uh, is the variance, let's say, delta square rho of A trace rho A square minus trace rho A square. And uh, this is zero only in this case. So if I take two different observables, let's say I just take this projection value three way well, case that is typical. Um, typically, so delta rho square of A and delta rho square of B cannot both be zero. If I draw an uncertainty diagram, I get some some figure in the plane where rho varies, and uh, these are the possible values. And one way to, to determine this is to draw a line here and say that um, delta rho squared A plus delta rho squared B, maybe with some weights, is larger than a constant, which is, which is strictly positive. So that's the typical situation. This will be a generalized uncertainty relation, which tells you that there's no possible points here, no pairs of variances that are that make them both small. Right? So for computing C, um, um, you need to compute ground states so the variance here is delta it's a uh, uh, well you look at uh, the, the sum of the variances is something like this a minus alpha squared plus b minus beta squared Right, this is the sum of the two variances. And you want to find the lowest possible value this can have. Now, if I fix alpha and beta, I know how to do this because then I have an operator here. 
and I simply have to look for the eigenvalue uh, for the lowest lying eigenvalue. So this is with fixed alpha and beta. Now you want to get rid of that, and one can, but uh, uh, so. But the typical problem that you have to solve numerically would be ground state problems of this sort. I'm not going to say more. We have a recent paper where we give an explicit algorithm that also takes care of the alpha and beta in a, in a good way. Actually, alpha and beta here are the minimizers of this expression. Um, so once if I know rho, I know what alpha and beta is best. And this, we initially use a lot of the algorithm to have alternate minimizations, which converges kind of okay, but doesn't lead to a provable minimum. And we have a better one now that does that. But this is, this is basically the form of an uncertainty equation. Now, in the, in the standard PQ case, this is very well known. Um, so if, if this is delta rho squared P uh, momentum and delta rho squared Q, then um, I have a symmetry in this problem which says that P is mapped to lambda times p, and q is mapped to lambda minus 1 q. This is a basic symmetry of quantum mechanics. Basically, if you wish, it's the choice of the length unit that you can, that you're free to choose in whatever way you want. And so with every point I get here, uh, this, this is a parameterization of a hyperbola. Right? And the only question or the complete, complete, complete computation of this uncertainty region is what is the lowest lying hyperbola? For that, again, you have to solve a ground state problem. That's the ground state problem for a harmonic oscillator. Everybody who has had a quantum mechanics course knows how to do that. And from that, you get the standard uncertainty relation with h bar over 2 on the, for the problem, actually. Right? So, so then you get delta rho squared p times delta rho squared. And so, so this, this, is, this is in every course. Right? I'm, I'm just mentioning all this um, to, to emphasize that there is something that, that, you, that a statement of the form, you cannot do this, which is very much at the, at the root of quantum mechanics and even every, every presentation of quantum mechanics. Now let's do the next thing. should be, I think I haven't talked about this before in this course, right? I, don't, I went through my notes and didn't find anything, so we definitely have to do this now. So I have two, two these are uh, generalized measurements, and I mean, uh, just, just observe this. Positive operators adding up to one, and now so so the, the box picture of such a thing is something that converts quantum information to classical information from a given outcome set. Now, what is a joint measurement? A joint measurement would be another measurement. property that ignoring one of the outcomes would replace uh, the, 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 these other two measurements. So, so you, you, this one is do, doing strictly more work than any one of these. And in the following sense, ignoring here just means summing over that outcome so that we would like to have that f of a is the sum of B of H of A. 
This means when I ignore this outcome, I mean, of course, I just I take the trace for the density operator to get the corresponding probabilities, and this density operator is arbitrary. So in, for an arbitrary state, um, I would apply this device and just ignore this part, which means I sum over all these probabilities. Right? And of course, there is a second relation. And of course, the HAB uh, should be positive operators. Right? And if that exists, then uh, I say these F and G are jointly measurable. Right? So, um, so if H exists, Many books uh, say simultaneously measurable, which is a term that I don't like because it overemphasizes the role of time. So the, the time at which a measurement happens isn't really important. The only, these are experiments that can take some time, right? But at, at after some, I mean, you know how to apply these devices and in each, each single shot, one preparation, one outcome, you record the outcomes and then you make a frequency analysis. Right? This is how quantum experiments work. And the, the time duration doesn't matter. So jointly means simultaneous only in the sense that this device is also used once per shot. Right? So in this collection process of getting your statistical data, um, you also use this H only once. Right? That's, that's the meaning of, would be the meaning of simultaneously and I think it's better expressed by saying jointly because it doesn't have this overemphasis of it, something like a time coordinate. So clearly there are some measurements that are jointly measured. Right? I pick up any H, label the outcomes of H in a square fashion, sum over some of them, and there you get some measurements that are jointly measured. Right? So, so clearly that does happen, but um, when one of the one of the observables that we have here is projection valued, you can be more specific. Then you know that actually there's a unique way of doing that, and this is the little lemma that I'm going to prove now. So 
So one of them is actually projection value. Hmm? That's, that's what I'm saying here. Um, then F and G jointly measurable. Commutation implies uh, the joint measurability, and in that case, H is actually uniquely determined as F of A times G of B. Now let's pause for a moment. Suppose I have this condition. Um, so this, this, this condition is, uh, I didn't write it in this lemma, but uh, um, suppose that I have this, such commuting observables. Then this formula here actually defines a positive operator. Why is that a positive operator? Because of the commutation, G would also commute with a square root. So I can pull the square root of F through G, and I have root F, G, root F which is obviously a positive operator, if G is positive. Right? So, uh, so this would actually find a positive operator as soon as these guys commute. Um, and, well, okay, uh, then it's also clear that from this formula, now these are all positive, and if I add up over A, I just get the normalization sum of A, so I get G left, and conversely. Right? So then, clearly, this is a joint measure. So commutation of all the f's and g's is sufficient for joint measurability. Actually, in general, um, it is not the case that um, that this is the only solution. Right? So the, we have a sharper statement here, saying that so if, if f and g are POVMs that happen to commute, then the joint measurement is not uniquely determined in general. Right? But in this particular case where, where this commutation actually comes from the projection value this is one of them, this is really the only choice that you can make. Okay, let's go over the proof. It uses uh, a lemma that we had way back uh, which says that if I have a positive operator, which is dominated by a projection, then actually they commute. And so AP is equal to PA is equal to PAP and is just equal to A. Right? So that means without any penalty, you can write another p next to it. That's, that's the statement. And it doesn't matter on which side. Right? Which also implies that they can move. So we proved that a while ago. And so this, this, this is the basic fact behind this statement. Now look at, we have, clearly we have that HAB is going to be less than F of A. So this is fine. So we know that whatever the H is, will have to commute with F of A. This would also be true for, oh, let me see. So apply this to, to this. And uh, of course, this, this was just positive. Right? Uh, and Enlarge this this side uh, 
by adding all terms that, um, that uh, further operators, namely f a whatever, uh, where the a is not equal to a prime. Right? So if I do that, I see that from this whole picture, I conclude that h a b has to commute with all other f a prime. It commutes with f a. So. Um, So, so from this one I get that uh, H A B is equal to H A B F of A. Um, and from this I get that um, well let's 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 write it like this. So if I have two different values of a, right, and I look at this prime, then in the case where a prime is equal to a, uh, I, I get from this that I just get my h a b back. So this is delta a a prime h of a b. And if 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 a prime is different, then, then this this case applies. And I get that H A B is equal to is it correct now? So if I, if I write this equation that a p is, is a, or this in this case, the h term drops out, and I get this equation. So that's that's correct. That's the way I remember it. I think it's correct. So that now, now we can take this sum and uh, sum over a. So if we apply the sum over a, we get that. I mean, this, this of course already shows that, that the commutation part, that h commutes with f. Uh, but let's, let's write the sum over a here. Then I get um, the sum over a is g of b, f of a prime. The sum over a here just puts an h prime there. So this is a, this is the equation that I that I claim, and of course because this is positive, it's a particular emission. Uh, I can take the star of this, and I see that the two have to commute. So so that proves it. So for the for the case where one of the observables is projection valued, joint measurability just means commutation, and we have a you have a direct formula um, for the what the joint measurement could look like. Okay, so what if not? Right? So this would be now another kind of uncertainty relation. So if uh, fg are not Just as in the, in the preparation case, the previous section, right, there is um, a preparation, uh, sorry, a measurement. So you can, you can quantify the degree to which this is not possible. Right? So that's, that's the main message. Um, in, the, in the preparation case, sharp preparability, um, this could be expressed by giving a quantitative relation for variances. Now, it's not so clear what would replace the variances here. 
Uh, so, but the, the basic statement is that um, um, F must deviate from uh, some and g and sum over a. And so there must be different observables somehow. I cannot do it exactly. And um, so uh, I can use various measures of equation. Now this is a topic that we have worked a lot about uh, in, the, in the recent, in, in the last two or three years. And uh, I think this would be carrying too far to do that, but there's also the quantitative relations for this. So I will distinguish a preparation uncertainty relation, which is the sort that uh, I sketched in the previous section. And the measurement uncertainty relation would be quantitative obstruction to the non-existence of a joint measurement. Now these problems are different problems. And um, so one way um, is this, so, um, so, so these two So if you know the, the if you know the preparation uncertainty relation, you cannot take that to get uh, measurement uncertainty. And conversely, now one um, so one example to show this: take um, F A so F projection valued and. Uh, And rank one, so um, and uh, G similar, huh? G, G, so then then phi and psi are basis, phi A, psi B are basis. And so these are complete for all my measurements, you know, projection value measurements. Uh, as fine as possible. Huh? Now, in that case, um, we can say that preparation uncertainty vanishes. Well, if they share some eigenstate. So that is if phi A is equal to a phase typically psi B. Uh, for some pair A B, right? Then then that eigenstate would be a joint eigenstate of these two observables and would get a result of certain measurement uncertainty. Well, what does that require? It requires that these observables commute, right? so that the, this rank one projection, um, ket graph psi phi, commutes with a psi, and this is true if and only if this scalar product is either zero or one. Right? So that is, if uh, phi of a can be some factor depending on a times psi of b of uh, b of a for some permutation b. So up to a permutation, they are really the same basis. And that's one that's a much stronger condition. Right? So and 
This, this shows that it's a different kind of problem. And we have a result showing that if, if you define the deviation in a certain way, in terms of the cost function and uh, some structures that I don't want to get into, then um, so this, this carries over to the numerical values. I mean, if you do that in the right way, then you can, can, uh, you can compare directly with variances. Right? So the, it makes it quantitatively meaningful to compare the two. And it turns out that preparation uncertainty is always smaller than measurement uncertainty. So measurement, the joint measurement problem is more demanding than the joint preparation problem. And, and there is actually a general inequality going to that. Okay, are there questions about that? We could, of course, this is this is a big open patch. But uh, I think if I want to go into that, I need at least uh, another, another lecture to do that nicely. Okay, so look, let's look at the next task. Another thing that is impossible is copying. Um, so this, this goes under the name uh, no cloning theorem. that has a, has a operation description. So a copy is something like this. It takes a quantum input and has two quantum outputs. Right? So if you take your zero or whatever copying machine, then after you've done the copying, you have two, two equally good, usually equally good copies. And, uh, and the condition, so, so this, uh, this of course can always be done, right? So, so some, uh, some device that spits out two quantum systems of the same sort, right, as, as the input system, is easily done. You just eat the system and prepare two new ones, right? But the idea is that, um, that Ignore, uh, ignore one outcome, which is now quantum, right? Um, uh, get uh, identity. So, so the idea is that if I, if I just ignore that, Part in one of the systems that I got out, then for every statistical measurement, uh, this device is as good as doing nothing. Right? So if I, that is uh, for all rho and f, uh, this sort of completed experiment, where now I take the cloner, so this is, let's say C, the copier. Then this, this gives a certain this gives you some probabilities, right? So um, so this this has the same probabilities as just doing this directly. Okay? And this is this is supposed to be true for arbitrary inputs. And arbitrary measurements that I do at the end. So that's that's the success criteria. It's a completely statistical criteria. I'm not saying anything about the individual case. Right? So this is sometimes suggested in the way of speed, right? So that I have the same system and I copy that. Well, the success criterion here is completely statistical and does not rely on 
the identity of these individual uh, systems. So, so this is impossible. Sure enough, I get a system that uh, that I get. I call this whole thing I would call HIV. Right? This would be H. And by the by the success criterion I gave for the clone is why it's it's clear that this is this this is okay because if I ignore this outcome, then I can ignore this whole length of operation. Right? So I can, this is the same as, I mean, measuring something and ignoring the output is as good as ignoring the system in the first place. Right? So nothing happens here. So, so the, the marginal condition that defines joint measurement would clearly be satisfied. So this is why broadcasting is impossible, or this, this copying is impossible. Now, There is another. There is another way to, to connect that. Uh, to another fact to connect it with. We have the statement that there is no measurement without disturbance, and that is saying that if such a device is faithful for f, then um, and this would be a state after the measurement. Right? So I could I could use it in a different way. I, I make the f measurement, and I take this as the state after the measurement. And the condition of copying means that this copy is as good as it, as it was anyhow. Right? So uh, that means that this whole device has to, um, well, uh, the, the, the outputs have to be uncorrelated with the inputs. The only, uh, the only observer I can do that with is the identity. Um, so that, that connects us to this no measurement without perturbation the result we had earlier. Um, now it's also, so the, 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 the history of this is that there was a paper by Wouters and Zurak, 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 Wojtek Zurak, um, with the title, A Single Quantum Cannot Be Cloned. And they had a simpler proof, actually, and this is why some people, uh, well, they had direct appeal to quantum mechanics. Right? This, is, this is very... This links it to other general facts that we know, but you could also make a direct proof inside of quantum mechanics uh, of something like that. And they only looked at pure states. So, so this is why some people distinguish the no-cloning theorem, which would be the Uta Zurek uh, setup, relating only to pure states. And uh, the, they would, this mixed state version that I described here, the roles here could be mixed, right? Everywhere. Um, this is sometimes called broadcasting, uh, but I think this this is the relevant fact. Now, how do you? What did we we learn to do? So, um, Wouters, uh, Wouters, we learned to in some ways. Yeah. Um, what they argued is that there is no linear map uh, so that u phi uh, is equal to phi tensor phi. Well, for a particular phi you can easily do that, right? but doing it for all at the same time is something that uh, you, you, you see that you get problems with the linearity. Right? So if you put a factor alpha here, 
uh, some, then you would get cross terms, and these kill this possibility of making a linear map like that. And this, this, is, this is basically the argument that they're used. You can see it's completely on the, on the vector level, on the pure state level. Um, but this is also sometimes referred to as no problem. Okay, so, one question? Yeah. Is there a relation between the quality of cloning and the quality of joint measurement? I guess so, you could make that some of that quantitative. Um, now, the, the, the cloning is also... Um, so, okay, so th th this is a long story. I mean, there are many, many aspects of this. One of them is that, after all, the quantum state is an operationally meaningful quantity. So why not just determine the quantum state experimentally and then re-prepare a new system? Um, I'll, I'll, actually, I'll come to that in the next section. Um, yeah, let, let me do that in the next section. Yeah, because this, this is exactly, in some sense, exactly the question of the next section. Um, for, the, for the numerical quality here, yes, I think that's one way of getting bounds on, on copying. So I was about to mention approximate cloning. So, so maybe I should, I should say that. So the, the, the point with this is, of course, the whole thing is co copying an unknown quantum state. Right? This is always important in this context, because copying a known quantum state, then you would basically erase this, this quantifier here, or this one for all row. If you just know the state, well, you can prepare it twice. Right? That's, that's trivial. Right? So the, the whole point is to have something that a device that works in a single shot, you, it gets just a quantum system, does something to it, and spits out two. Right? Now, the, the, the um, determining the state experimentally approach, well, it, that is of course possible, but a state is, makes a statistical state. That is, it tells you something that, about what happens if you repeat measurements very often. So what you could do, indeed, is you get many copies of the state that you want to clone, let's say n copies, and you would, you're supposed to produce one more of the same kind. That's a different task, right? Because what you could actually always do is make an, an estimate of your state from, the, from these n, from the sample size n, and then prepare another state with that satisfy that, that, that is in, consistent with that estimate. So, so from if you have many copies, you can make more. Actually, this measure and re-prepare scheme is not the best, so there's a long literature about that from the early days of quantum information, end of the, two, uh, end of the previous millennium. And um, so, so people found out that actually the, a direct quantum operation that takes many copies and makes more copies can outperform this measure and re-prepare scheme. So this is approximate cloning. Of course, it really would never, this estimate would never be exact. You, you make a statistical estimate. And even if n is very large, this will, not, this will have errors. So, so you have to actually have to discuss approximate cloning. And the, the quality factors from cloning from n to m copies, m larger than n, um, they are known explicitly, and you can compute what is the optimal way of doing that and stuff like that. So this is the, the topic of approximate cloning. It's only interesting in this case when you have many copies to begin with. Here this is uh, strictly one input copy. And then, then actually the, there is an optimal cloner for that as well, but it performs very badly. Right? So it, it would be like a universal joint measurement attempt and it really doesn't do very well. We actually compare, compare that to the, uh, to the measurement uncertainties. You always get a bound from the cloning, and you get some joint measurement by using the optimal cloner there. Um, actually, for the cloning, there's also asymmetric cloning, where one of the copies is supposed to be better than the other. You set the targets unevenly. And then, of course, it's clear that at some point you get a perfect copy for on the first channel, 
and a totally messed up, newly prepared state, input state independent thing on the other channel. Right? And you can interpolate between those, and therefore you get different joint measurements that have a different trade-off of the quality with which the two observables are approximated. Okay, so let's get to the next one. Wasn't the an argument about the scalar products of the U is Yeah, you want U to be unitary also. But but even a linear operator with this property would also not exist. Isn't that right? Uh, unless it's Yeah, I think even just a linear operator doesn't work. Okay. Then do you can would you see that offhand? I think you use polarization. Yeah, and you can't even do it in a linear way. Any operator which satisfies this has to be linear because it maps unit vectors to unit vectors. So. You mean you can conclude the linearity? No, no, no but, but any operator which satisfies this has to be an isometry. It has to be. Ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it takes unitary to unit. Uh, I mean, yeah. pure states to pure states. Yeah, yeah. But uh, that is not a very strong condition on. Spaces of different dimension. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Okay. So let's get to the next one. Okay, the next one would be number four. So, so you have some quantum systems that are given to you, unknown, of course. Yeah? Otherwise, again, the whole thing is going to be trivial. And I, this whole transmission system um, will have two parts: one on the sender side. Um, so this is a conversion of quantum information to classical information, and. Uh, Back to quantum information. Now it's clear what this is, right? So this is uh, so this is like uh, 
So this is quantum information, classical information. And these are the translation bits. Now, we, but we know what this is. Um, this is just a measurement. Any kind of measurement will do that. Right? This is, so this is a measurement. And the measurement results, I don't know, A. This is a read preparation. So, so this will be some, let's say, this is some observable f, and these are some rho a. And then the overall state is clear. So it takes uh, an input state rho is taken to the sum of these the certain weights. Right? So the outcome a here has probability rho f a. And with that probability, I reprepare a state and sum over all possible outcomes. So this is this is what that device does. Right? And now, of course, I can do that, but the success criteria in this case, when is this a good transmission? Well, then it's, it's, it should be a faithful transmission, and that means this this thing should be equivalent to doing nothing. Again, in the sense I could draw additional boxes emphasize that. You can make a statistical experiment where you can either use your state directly, your, your prepared systems directly, or you feed it through such a device. And uh, so the issue is whether you can choose these guys, the measurement and the, uh, and the re-preparations, in any arbitrary way so that this becomes equal to rho always. And then this would be a successful translation of quantum information to classical and back. And that would actually make quantum information a special case of classical. Because what the, the abstraction of classical information theory is that I can basically losslessly convert between different representations of the same information, it would be printed or on a screen or as electromagnetic waves or whatnot, right? All these things can be translated to each other. And this would be saying that this kind of information that quantum systems carry can also be converted to classical information and back without loss. So actually it would be a special case of this classical information theory. So the, the fact that this cannot be done um, is of course at the heart of quantum information theory. This is why we have a separate theory for this. The sort of stuff that travels on quantum systems cannot be translated to, this, uh, to the classical world and back. Now, here's the proof. So, I say there is no observable f together with re-preparation -pre states such that this identity holds for all rho. Of course, it can hold for some, right? It's always possible. But the point is, I cannot do this for all rho. And here's the proof, very simple. Um, so I have my f, and I get an output a. Now I use a classical copier, and then use my row a on those. And then if we get some quantum systems out. Now, classical information can be copied without bounds. Right? So you just, you've written down that on paper and you just give that paper to somebody else. This is always possible. Right? So, uh, but then if you look at this description, what this would mean is that if I ignore that part, so I didn't actually give the paper to my friend, that still makes this a good copy. That was the assumption. Right? But then I would act exactly have a copy. And we've already decided that is impossible. So, so if I had uh, some such translation system, the classical information, I could easily make a copy out of it. 
And since we know that this is impossible, this must also be impossible. Of course, you can, you can try to prove that directly. It's, it's, well, actually, how easy is that? It's kind of messy. I don't. Do you see a direct proof? Does this kind of work? Yes. I mean, I just proved it. But uh, yeah. one that sort of directly tries to work with these f's and these rows. I mean, if so, the channel that you wrote down is an entanglement breaking channel, but you, and but the identity channel is not entanglement breaking. For example. Yeah. Okay. So that's okay. that's just restating this. <laughs> so. Yeah, true. It's, well, an, it's an entanglement break channel. Yeah, two different channels, so you can. Yeah. Right. I mean, you can say. Well, one one of the things you can say is that the image of this channel will always be in the convex hull of this set. So, if you want to do this with qubits, you at least would have to have one every pure state in that setup. Um, Yes, but your, your statement is, is actually better. Let's apply that to an entangled state, and then necessarily what comes out, we discussed that a little bit, um, has to be separable. And we know that they're non separable states. So that's, of course, all these things are related. So, um, yeah, I, uh, for the moment, I'm not offering you a quantitative version of that. The quantitative version of that would be that an entanglement breaking channel has quantum capacity zero. So you cannot even do this approximately and asymptotically well. Um, actually, you would want to use the, the, the strong converse part of that to say that there is a minimum error that you incur necessarily when you try to do Okay, so um, what else do I have on my list? Um, I mean, I can copy something classically, right? Yes. And how do I do that? Yes. I go to the pure state level, define the clone, the, 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 the copying map on the on the pure states, mm -hmm. where it's easy. Mm -hmm. And then if, I, if, you, if you give me a mixture, I apply that with the weights of the classical system. So it's actually related to another possible machine, if you wish. Uh, and be unscrambling a mixture, I'll come to that. Yeah, but, but the claim is, isn't what classically happens when you copy is a linear operator, but just not unitary operator? It's a, it would be a linear operator on the level of probability distributions. So at the level of the outcomes of the, of the sample space, there doesn't even have to be any kind of linear structure. Yeah, sure. right? so, so, but on the level of, of density operators or of probability distributions, this is also what we require here. Yeah, but, but then how does it contradict the claim that there is no linear operator? Such that. Ah, I see what you mean. Uh, the, 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 okay. Um, Just to answer that. Okay, so what you want to do is you, you have a map that takes a classical probability distribution mm -hmm. and then does classical cloning, so you get a probability distribution of two systems, yeah. which will be the tensor product. And, uh, and this can be perfect copies. Right? Yeah. Okay. But this is not a tensor product. These copies are highly correlated. Actually, they're better. Mm -hmm. So it's not a map from x to x tensor x. That is linear, right? Mm -hmm. 
What, what I was claiming is that you cannot make a good linear map that takes from one vector space to a tensor product with itself that would properly map the diagonal. This would not be an example of that because uh, the, the clones are not in a tensor product. They're not independent. Okay. Well, okay. But, but what does classical cloning cloning is? I mean, how do, how do you do the classical cloning? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm you have a measure that is that is concentrated on the diagonal, right? So with probability one, the two. Yeah, but I, I would like to start with some like big quantum physical system, and in the end, obtain in some limit classical, get some, some classical clone. Maybe by tracing out some subsystems or something. Like that. Well, you can if you in principle in the classical case you can make this complete measure. F F here would be. Um, a complete readout of the microstate of the system. Yeah, but well, the phase space. Pattern. I do not want to start with, with classical theory, but I want to start with like underlying quantum theory. Then yes. uh, take some limit, and then. Ah, okay, yeah, that's. Uh, I think we should discuss that later. But but it's uh, only just. It's not immediately a kind of example of what I've said. Mm. And, but, but what exactly you want to actually sort out there. So, so this is a completely trivially impossible task. What it, what it basically would be is you have a source, and it would be do something here. And uh, Measure something here. This would be sending information, and, and of course, in such a way that the, the distribution of measurement results here depend on what I, depend on what I did. Right? So this is called signaling, and in this situation, I just have a correlated system. And the systems are widely separate. There's no dynamical interaction here that could carry this information. And then, well, uh, I should I should be able to do that. Um, and it's it's this is classically completely clear and uh, causal thinking in terms of uh, properties of the world. This would be a very a-causal thing because if I just have a correlation, I would be free to make my measurement any time without changing the results, essentially. So I could do that before the signal is actually sent. And this would create causality loops and stuff like that. And this is actually also not possible in quantum mechanics. Right? So uh, as, um, this is sometimes suggested in explanations of time. So if you read explanations of entanglement, you very often read things like, if you do something to this spin, then simultaneously, suddenly, superluminally fast, the other spin will do something, will change its state and also become aligned or something like that. So, so this is actually a very common topic uh, in, in, in the popular reception of entanglement. Uh, for example, it's used as a communication device uh, in, in Philip Pullman's novel, what's it called? His Dark Materials, like the, the, um, it's a German title. Nah, that doesn't matter. But, but it, as, as a fictional thing, it, it, it has been used, right? So that between different worlds, you can s still c uh, uh, maintain communication uh, by using a tank, basically by sending signals out. And uh, um, so I want to emphasize this trivial fact, but uh, quantum, quantum theory does not allow this.
many more than us. What I mean is, in either case, it's completely obvious that correlations are not good for sending signals. Right? So, if uh, Alice and Bob buy the same newspaper every day, but one lives here and one the other lives far away, um, they will not surprise that they read the same paper. Right? The same, there's a complete correlation there, but this is completely useful for Alice telling Bob anything. They read the same thing at the same time, but it's completely useless for communication. And that is just as true in the quantum case. So, so actually, what are these correlations? Right? So Alice would make some measurement. And Bob can take some measurement or so. Right? So this, this would be the correlations, or the probabilities of in that, in that correlation experiment. And uh, uh, so, uh, so Alice will choose which observable to take, and uh, Bob measures. But then, given just the results that Bob sees, right, Bob gets So the probability for Bob to get some results, given these devices, uh, is just the sum over A, because it doesn't see that result, then trace uh, rho f A, A tensor B. But this is an observable, so this gives the identity. <laughs> So this is trace rho 1 tensor b. And, and this function, doesn't, this probability function, does not depend on fa. You could say this is because they are all normalized to the same identity. Right? Um, so, but in this form, it is sort of completely built into the formalism. Right? It's not, it's, this, is, this is not a deep computation. And it's, it's actually, the, the assumptions that lead to that are there much earlier. Right? They are basically saying that. If you make a measurement that sends no signal back to the source, right? if that were the case, well, then you couldn't you couldn't write quantum mechanics the way we do. There is a locality assumption here that nothing comes back, and uh, that goes. This assumption basically goes into this fact that all normalizations of observables are to the same identity operator, no matter what observable you take. Right? That's basically the same statement. Newby once called that the principle of direct interaction. And that is at play. Right? So this normalization condition in, uh, rules out that on the correlations you can send anything. So why am I, am I emphasizing this? Um, because I now let's say, let's something, do something that works. 2, 5. Um, yeah. I, I'm skipping one now. This will be teleportation. So, so this combines combines uh, uh, this I sometimes call Bell's telephone, but Bell had nothing to do with it. Right? So it uh, combines signaling on correlations. An impossible machine. With uh, sending on classical channel. So, i.e., two impossible machines. Maybe one that works perfectly. So I'm 
providing that, so that's wrong form to make clear that up to now all the states, the, the tasks that I mentioned were actually impossible according to quantum mechanics. Now I'm changing the sign, right? so the, the next will be uh, something that does work. And now here's the, here's the scheme. classical translation. The only thing that is uh, sent here is classical information, and, but there's also a shared correlation between these two stations. Right? So the shared correlation alone would be that impossible machine that doesn't help to send anything. Um, this is, well, you can send something, but you, you would always mess up some quantum state in some way. Right? But if you combine the two, it works. So let's say we have an observer f here. Let's say f uh, a a, and there's a uh, there's an operation here because you have a quantum input and a classical input, and uh, a trans let's say a transformation that depends on a, and that gives you the output. Right? So so let's say this is the, the basic Hilbert space. We want to compare at the end with the identity, so these, these two spaces have to be the same, right? Uh, and then there's another Hilbert space here. Well, they could be different in principle. In the end, you all choose, choose all the Hilbert spaces to be the same. And there's, there's an initial preparation called it, uh, let's say, omega. And then you get an input state here, an unknown input state, so, right, so here it comes. Uh, we make a measurement at the end of some result b. This is pretty much arbitrary. Right? F of b I've been writing today. So that is the basic scheme. And the claim is that if I choose these guys right, I mean the entangled state, or this, this state here, uh, the measurement on two systems, and the transformation if I do that right, I get a mean something which is uh, just uh, rho uh, so let's suppose give this guy a g so this is this is, gives all the same statistics as a direct measurement. So in that sense it's an ideal transmission, but the same sort of criterion that we have. Um, and now the question is, how do you choose these guys? Okay, so um, how much time do I have? Ten minutes, right? So let us let us just uh, set up the equations. And um, so there, there's a, a long version of this story. The short version again would we'll just do a qubit example. That's how it started. Right? The paper was by. Uh, Wouters, Harris, Charlie Bennett, of course, uh, Richard Joza, and maybe missing. There's one, was one, uh, Gilles Passard was making yeah. it. Yeah. So, so all this stuff like the no cloning theorem, this was, these were things that if you had asked people in the, let's say, in the 70s, who had some understanding of the foundations of quantum mechanics, is this possible or not? They would have come up with it, with the right answer pretty quickly. Right? So let's say, I don't know, it, it's anybody's guess, but it, it, it would be straightforward to deduce the, an answer to the question: Is cloning possible if it's form, formalized like that? Um, proving that in from an understanding of quantum mechanics, let's say in the seventies, would have been quite feasible. This is a completely new thing. This was totally unexpected, I think. And uh, it's, yeah, okay. Anyway, they, they came up with that. And um, so what we can do in the, in the remaining minutes is at least setting up the equations to see what kind of equations do we have to solve. Then next week, I think, 
uh, my proposal would be to take the long version here, not just do the qubit example, but see exactly how you can do it. And actually, that case is related to when all these Hellman spaces have the same dimension, d, and a takes d squared values. For a reason that one can see, especially in hindsight, this is the critical case. So, so let's say, uh, well, that would be for next time, and I think we could do that quite nicely. There's, I have a paper on that from the early 2000s, um, where classification of all teleportation and decoding schemes. It's also good material for some exercises. That, so I think that's that's good stuff for the for the coming week, where I will be away, basically. Okay, so what is the equation that we have to solve? So, so the input state here, we start with the input state. And this, this tensor product hides uh, a subtlety, namely that this is already on uh, this, this is already on a tensor product space, this, that this, this entangled state here, or this source state, this correlated state. So, so the Hilbert spaces here would be H tensor, and then in brackets, K1 tensor K2. Right? So this is the initial state. Now, everything that we do will be a measurement of that initial state. But what is the measurement? Now, let's start from the back here. So, so we, the, the basic description runs on this triple tensor product. Right? Now, um, the, the, this, is, this is a channel that depends on A, right? so, um, but TA by itself is a channel. So TA goes from B of H, which is the H out in this case, right? to B of K1. So, so one of the observables that is measured is the TA applied to this guy. Okay, so that's that is what is measurement on the measured on the K1 side. So, um, so this is one. This, okay, so what is measured is then I have to make a space here. So we certainly we measure FA, and then there's a TA on G. So again, this tensor product hides a subtlety. Now this guy lives on H tensor K1. And this, uh, sorry, K1, K2. Um, and this guy lives on K2. Right? So both, both sides, both sides live on this, this overall tensor product of three factors. But it's group this tensor. You would you would be inclined to just group R row and F A together, but that would be wrong because actually there is this shifting of the tensor product split. And that's of course a key feature of this one. Um, okay, so so this is the probability. Um, this is the probability that we get for measuring A and B. This this pair of values, A and B, uh, in this situation. But we actually don't care about A, right? So we have to write a sum over A. And uh, then the claim is that this is going to be trace row uh, G of B for all row G B. And then you just stick sum operator there, it doesn't really matter what it is. Okay, so this is the teleportation equation, and we have to solve this by uh, well, solve this by choice of f and t and, and omega, of course. And um, well, shall we do one for the next step? So the let's let me just mention right. So the interesting case here. Dimension of the Hilbert space of FD. Right? So all this, these Hilbert spaces have the same dimension. And of course, in the initial example, the only example they had in this paper, 
this d was 2. Everything was in terms of qubits. Right? And, uh, and a takes d squared values. So this is, this is the interesting case. And uh, then um, all solutions can be uh, parameterized. Let me, let me first comment on the d squared. Right? So for qubits, there would be four possible values going. That is, I need two bits, two classical bits for the teleportation process. Right? Um, this is kind of natural because the Hilbert space on which we measure is four-dimensional. It's d squared dimensional. So the fa could be a projective measurement with just that many outputs. And that's actually is going to turn out to be necessary. So this, 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 this gives you the link between this e and this funny d squared value. This is saying I have, a, I have the square dimension here for the input. And uh, okay, by, and then what you basically, the, this, this fa there has to be um, by an orthonormal basis. That will be the measurement basis of this fa an orthonormal basis of maximally entangled states. So it's clear what an orthonormal basis is. Uh, there would be a basis in, in uh, H tensor K1. Yeah? of maximally entangled states, I do, I do. and this, this will be the basic result. Right? So if I have this orthonormal basis, I can turn that also, I can also compute what these twisting operations TA have to be, they have to be unitary. Omega itself has to be maximally entangled and pure, and then the whole scheme works. So probably the best thing would be to um, set out these objects and see that that actually solves the equation. Uh, and then maybe going into why this is the only way to solve it. Now the, in, in higher dimension, in, in two dimensions, there is, up to rotations, there is only one basis of maximum entangled states, so the so-called belt states. Um, in higher dimension, there are more possibilities. And there's a whole zoo, uh, if you increase the dimension, related to things like Kalaman matrices, well, okay, that will be for next week. So I'll see you in two weeks now, or almost two weeks, on the coming Wednesday. So, thanks.